Okay guys, I have good news for you. If you're hearing this ad right now, it means one thing. It means that you are still alive. So what that means is that you've still got time to get life insurance with Ethos. With Ethos, you could get life insurance in 10 minutes for as little as $10 a month. Unlike other companies' long, confusing, and outdated application process, Ethos 100% online application takes only minutes so you can get back to living. I know personally for me, I've always heard about life insurance and the importance of life insurance, but the whole idea of actually signing up for it has always been so daunting and intimidating. I never knew where to start, but that's why I was so thankful that Ethos made it such an easy and seamless process. Every year you wait, life insurance premiums increase by eight to 10%. Get a free personalized quote at ethoslife.com slash killer. That's E-T-H-O-S life.com slash killer. Go to ethoslife.com slash killer to get your free life insurance quote today. Ethos Technologies Inc. operates in California as Ethos Life Insurance Services. Not available in all states and prices subject to underwriting in certain health questions. Hello everyone, what is up? Welcome back to another episode of Killer Instinct and welcome to the fourth episode of Hollow Week. If you are just tuning in for the very first time today and are unfamiliar about what Hollow Week is, Hollow Week is the one time of year where we post five back-to-back true crime cases from October 24th through October 28th. I always say that it's the craziest time of the year, but it is also my favorite time of the year. If you haven't already, you can go and listen to the three other episodes that were posted this week. And tomorrow is the last episode of Hollow Week, which I truly can't even believe. I can't believe that we're almost at the end of Hollow Week. I feel like it flew by this year and I cannot wait to be here again next year to do this all over again. I love this little tradition that we have created. I love it. Now, as you guys can tell by the title of today's episode, today we are talking about the brutal and horrific murder of Rebecca Gay. This is a terrifying case. It is one that is so preventable as well, and you guys are going to be very frustrated by it. I can read the comments already. I know that you guys are going to be just as shocked as I was and just as frustrated as I was as well. So I'm really interested to hear what you guys have to say about it. But with that being said, let's not waste any more time. Let's jump right on in to today's episode. Rebecca Jane Gay was born on March 26, 1988 in Midland, Michigan to her parents, Thomas and Sally. Rebecca grew up being one of four children and graduated from Bullock Creek High School in 2007. And after graduating, she went on to attend cosmetology school. Rebecca was incredibly passionate about cosmetology, specifically hair, and after she graduated cosmetology school, she went on to work at a hair salon. However, at the time of her death, she was working at a Goodwill store, and she had actually been recently promoted to head cashier at the time of her death, so she was really thriving at the time. Rebecca was known as the girl who lived life to the fullest, and she was incredibly family-oriented, and so when she had her first son, Conway, she was absolutely thrilled. Conway was her life, and her, Conway, as well as Rebecca's fiance, a man named Aaron Quinn, were all very excited to start a new chapter of their lives together. Now, Aaron, Conway, and Rebecca were all living with Aaron's parents. However, three months prior to Rebecca's death, she actually ended up moving out and moving into a mobile home for her and Conway. Rebecca and Aaron were still together. They were still engaged. Their relationship didn't end, but the reason for the move was because Rebecca needed to be closer to work. So they decided for the meantime, until they could save up enough money to move in together in their own place, this is the layout that worked best for them. 
And clearly she made the right decision because she ended up being promoted to head cashier. So at the time of Rebecca's death, she was really thriving in her life. She had her incredible son, her fiance, a good job. She was incredibly close with her family, more specifically her mom. Her and her mom attended church together. And the church that they went to was the Christ Community Fellowship Church. Now, at the time that Sally and Rebecca started going to the church, Sally, Rebecca's mother, was single. Rebecca's parents had gotten divorced when she was younger. However, when the two of them, meaning Rebecca and Sally, started going to church together, that is where Sally met a man named John Douglas White, who was actually the pastor of the church. The two of them hit it off, they started dating, and they actually ended up getting engaged. Now you may think, or you may not, however, I think the stereotype is that because John White was a pastor, that he had to be some amazing guy, right? And again, maybe you don't think that, and you're really not about to think that with what I'm about to tell you right now. So let's talk about this John White. John White was born on May 20th, 1957. He served in the Navy and was also a long haul truck driver, and he was someone who was no stranger to the law. In 1980, when John was 22 years old, he was living in Battle Creek, Michigan, and was married to his first wife. Now, one day during this time, he had invited his 17 year old neighbor, a girl named Teresa Etherton, over to his basement to check out a racetrack that he had built. Teresa and John had a friendly relationship. She was obviously their neighbor, she was familiar with their family, and so she decided to go over and check out this racetrack. And while she was standing there looking at John's racetrack, he came up from behind her and began stabbing her, all while having a smile on his face. He stabbed her a total of 15 times, but by some miracle, Teresa was able to survive. She was able to tell police that after John had attacked her, he wiped her mouth off and kissed her while holding her hand and told her, quote, you're going to go now. I'm really sorry you had to go like this, but what the fuck? You're just a woman. End quote. If you're watching me on YouTube, you're seeing me smile right now. And trust me, it is not because I'm happy. It is because I am full of rage out of that statement. Now, like I said, luckily, by some miracle, Teresa was able to escape out of the house and John was arrested for attempted murder. So because of this, he gets sentenced to five to 10 years in prison, which doesn't really feel like long enough for trying to take someone's life. However, I digress. Because honestly, for Teresa, she was just glad that John was put behind bars. However, what she did not know was that John had actually appealed his case and won. John appealed on the grounds that his attorney never raised the insanity defense, and John claimed that had his attorney given him the option to plead insanity, he would have done so. And along with that, John's father was actually the one paying for his attorney. And in order to plead insanity, you need to take a psychiatric exam, which would have cost about $1,000 at the time. And John's father did not want to pay that. So John claimed that because he couldn't pay for the psychiatric exam and because the insanity plea wasn't even an option for him, He said his attorney did not have the best interest of his client. So instead of a new trial, John actually ended up getting a new sentence. And the new sentence was pretty much that John was a free man. He ended up getting out of jail after only serving a little over two years years. And once he was released, he was put on probation. His probation was set to last for two years, contingent on him getting mental health treatment. So basically his five to 10 year sentence turned into him only serving two years then having to be on probation for an additional two years, contingent on him getting help for his mental health. Now you would think that the woman who John attempted to murder would be made aware of the fact that her almost killer was released. However, she was not. She was never notified about what happened and John was a free man. Now this ended up happening several years before something called the Victims' Rights Act was put into effect. 
The Victims' Rights Act requires the court system to include victims and notify them when there are any updates about their case. And again, this was put into place several years later, so Teresa was not given the right to know about the fact that John was released. So you can imagine her terror when several years later, when Teresa was standing in line at the Secretary of State's office and she heard someone call out her name, and when she turned around, she saw John standing in line behind her, smiling. Can we just take a moment and think about the insanity of that and how terrifying that must have been in that moment? The fact that not only did she have to go through one of the most horrific experiences that no one should have to endure in their entire life. However, she's not even given the courtesy of knowing that the person that tried to kill her is released from jail. And she's continuing her life thinking that she would have that courtesy. And then one day she turns around and sees the man who tried to kill her standing right behind her. It's unfathomable. But John was a free man, like I said. So this brings us to several years later in July of 1994. And this is when John is still married to his wife, by the way. They didn't end up getting a divorce. They remained married. And at this point, they had one child and they had another one on the way. However, regardless, John was having an affair with a coworker at the time. This coworker was 26-year-old Vicki Wall. Now, surveillance footage captured Vicki getting into a black pickup truck in a grocery store parking lot at 3 a.m. in July of 1994. And that was the last time that she was ever seen alive. Now, police were able to narrow down the suspect list to John White because they were able to figure out that the two of them were having an affair. And along with that, John also had a black pickup truck. Now, when police spoke with John, he admitted to the affair, however, denied harming Vicky and said that he dropped her off at her house safely the following morning. Now, police did not believe John. They did not believe John at all. However, they didn't have any evidence to prove that he did or did not harm Vicky. So because of that, they had to release him. However, six weeks later, Vicky's body was found in a rural area two miles from the grocery store where she was last seen alive. Her body was so badly decomposed that the medical examiner couldn't determine the cause of death. However, Vicky was found with no clothes on and her shirt and bra were wrapped around her neck. Now, at this point, police brought John back in for questioning, and this time they ended up doing a luminol test on his truck, and the luminol test revealed blood in several areas throughout the truck. Now, at this time, when John was pretty much caught red-handed, John told police that he may have harmed Vicky. However, if he did, it was because he was in the midst of a blackout spell. So he doesn't remember if he hurt her or not, but he says that it is possible. He just does not know. Now, John ended up getting arrested for this, and he pled guilty to involuntary manslaughter and received 8 to 15 years in prison. At his sentencing, he apologized to Vicky's family and said that her death was a tragic accident and that he loved Vicky very much. While in prison, John ended up writing a letter to his wife where he said, quote, I am just feeling some relief now that things are starting up on the possibility that I may go to prison for the rest of my life and I can't help but think that it may be better for you and the kids if I am gone, end quote. And while he was in prison, his wife did end up divorcing John. So she divorces him and goes on with her life with their two children. And John is stuck in prison. And while he is in there, he ended up meeting with a psychologist and while talking to a psychologist, John decided to finally open up about some of his fantasies. According to John, the biggest fantasy that he had was to murder the prosecutor and his defense attorney, 
and then have sex with their bodies. And so obviously because of this statement, the police notified the prosecutor and the defense attorney for their own safety. And you would think that a statement like this would keep John in prison for a very long time or possibly even longer than what his sentence was. However, after 13 years, he was released again in 2007. And that is when he moved to Mount Pleasant, Michigan and became the pastor of the church, met Sally and got engaged. And you might be wondering if the followers of the church and the people who attended, if they knew about John's past And the answer to that is that John was very honest. He did not hide from his past. He made all of the people who attended the church aware of what he did. However, he did angle it in a way that he believed that he had been forgiven for his sins and he wanted everyone else to forgive him as well. And he really presented himself as this religious man who was dedicated to turning his life around and righting his wrongs. And part of turning his life around included Sally. And Sally and Rebecca were also very welcoming of John. Rebecca in particular was very nice to John. She spent time with him one-on-one. She also allowed him to babysit Conway on certain occasions. And Rebecca always wanted John to feel welcome. And so did Sally. The two of them really opened their arms and their family up to John and made him feel welcome and accepted and not judged for his past decisions. So this all brings us to the day after Halloween, November 1st, 2012. Okay, guys, I have good news for you. If you're hearing this ad right now, it means one thing. It means that you are still alive. So what that means is that you've still got time to get life insurance with Ethos. With Ethos, you could get life insurance in 10 minutes for as little as $10 a month. Unlike other companies' long, confusing, and outdated application process, Ethos 100% online application takes only minutes, so you can get back to living. I know personally for me, I've always heard about life insurance and the importance of life insurance, but the whole idea of actually signing up for it has always been so daunting and intimidating. I never knew where to start, but that's why I was so thankful that Ethos made it such an easy and seamless process. Every year you wait, life insurance premiums increase by eight to 10%. Get a free personalized quote at ethoslife.com slash killer. That's E-T-H-O-S life.com slash killer. Go to ethoslife.com slash killer to get your free life insurance quote today. Ethos Technologies Inc. operates in California as Ethos Life Insurance Services. Not available in all states and prices subject to underwriting in certain health questions. Hey guys, what's up? It's Savannah. I wanted to take a quick second away from Hollow Week to announce to my Killer Instinct family that I am starting a brand new podcast called My Thoughts Exactly. If you're familiar with my lifestyle channel on YouTube, then you already know that I have a lot of thoughts and I am certainly not afraid to share them. Everything from horrible breakups, self-worth, navigating friendships, health and wellness, and simply navigating life, I've shared it all. And don't worry, Killer Instinct isn't going anywhere, but I'm so excited to bring it back where it all started and tell it like it is. That includes the good, the bad, and the ugly. Think of it like us FaceTiming over a glass of wine. First episode premieres on November 9th, and you can subscribe on any podcast platform to stream it, and I can't wait to see you there. Now, on November 1st, 2012, Rebecca was scheduled to work a shift at Goodwill. However, she never showed up. And this was extremely unlike Rebecca. She loved her job. Like I just said, she was promoted recently. So she was very responsible when it came to her job and her shifts. She was always timely and punctual. So her coworkers were actually the ones that reported her missing. That's how abnormal it was for her to just miss a day of work without telling anyone. And that same day, November 1st, 2012, police began their search. Rebecca's family was notified and everyone started looking for her right away. Everyone hit the ground running, including John. John told everyone who attended the church to pray for Rebecca and her family during this time and to pray for Rebecca's peaceful return. And of course, at first, police wanted to speak to Aaron because as I'm sure it's no surprise by now, you always talk to the spouse first or the partner, significant other. That's who police wanted to talk to. And in this case, it was Aaron. 
Now, Aaron told police that he had not heard from Rebecca since the night prior. And like I said, the two of them didn't live together. So Aaron had no way of knowing if she was at home on Halloween night or not. All he could tell police is that early that morning on November 1st, John had actually dropped Conway off to him early in that morning. Now, of course, that leads police to the question of what was John doing with Conway? Why did John bring Conway to Aaron? That was not something that typically happened. That was not something normal for them. It was typically always Rebecca bringing Conway to Aaron or Sally bringing Conway to Aaron. But John and Aaron never really crossed paths very much. So based off of that story, police now knew that they needed to talk to John. And when police asked John if he knew where Rebecca was or knew anything about where she had been the night prior, John denied having any knowledge of what happened happened to Rebecca. However, the people who knew John and saw him that day thought differently. One of the mobile home park workers remembers seeing John on the day of Halloween and said it looked like he had some scratches on his face. And when this man saw John, John had told him that Rebecca was missing and that her car was found outside of a bar called Barn Door. Now, knowing John's history, police began prying more and more, and more. And I don't think it necessarily takes a genius to know that this was not a coincidence. When looking at John's history and looking at this incident, it is very clear, especially with John being the one that last had Rebecca's son, police knew they had their guy. It was just about getting him to confess, and ultimately, he did. According to John, he said that after having a few beers, he had gone over to Rebecca's home at around 2 a.m. on October 31st, so on the very early morning hours of Halloween. According to John, he said that he had been having fantasies about killing Rebecca and having sex with her body for months leading up to the murder. He said that when he walked into Rebecca's home, he walked into her bedroom and hit her over the head several times with a rubber mallet while she was sleeping before she was on the ground and unconscious. He then strangled her to death with a zip tie. And John claims that before she fell into unconsciousness, Rebecca was able to mutter out a few final words, which were, I know you. After killing her, he said that he then removed Rebecca's clothes and began touching her body. He then put Rebecca's body into the back of the car and drove her a mile away from her home where he disposed of her in a ditch in Isabella County. Now to make matters worse, three-year-old Conway was in the house during the time of his mother's murder and police presume, and honestly, I think everyone hopes for his sake, that he slept all the way through the attack. And after disposing of Rebecca's body, John then returned back to Rebecca's home, cleaned her house, and also moved Rebecca's car and drove it to the Barn Dorn bar and left it in the parking lot. And the reason he did that was because he was trying to throw police off and give off the impression that Rebecca had been abducted. He also claimed that he threw Rebecca's purse, phone, and car keys into the mobile home trash container, and after all of that was done, he then went back to Rebecca's house, grabbed Conway, dressed Conway up in his Halloween costume for the day, and dropped him off at Aaron's house. After his confession, John led police to Rebecca's body and told them that he had been fantasizing about murdering her for weeks and that the thought of this had stemmed from some violent pornographic videos that he had been watching that involved necrophilia. Now, even though Rebecca's body was found without any clothes and even though John had admitted to touching Rebecca, he claims he does not remember if he raped Rebecca's body. He was very candid, though, in telling police that he tried to get an erection after the attack in order to have sex with her, but struggled to do so. Now, typically, evidence of sexual activity can be proven in an autopsy. However, that has not been released to the public, so we don't know. The public does not know, and it's unclear whether or not the police know either. 
Now, John was immediately arrested for second degree murder and was sentenced to 56 years in prison in April of 2013. And the smoking gun in this case was the fact that Rebecca's blood was found in both John and Rebecca's home, as well as a bloodied necklace that belonged to Rebecca in the trunk of John's car. So that's the physical evidence that they needed. At the sentencing, Rebecca's mother, Sally, showed up to court to read a statement to John, her ex-fiance, at this point. She said, John, Rebecca was always kind to you. She spent time with you, defended you, and you repaid her by brutally taking her life. I don't believe you have any regrets or remorse for what you have done. I believe you will do this again because you are a very evil man. For 20 excruciating hours, we prayed that Rebecca would come home. She was not yours to take. How dare you? At the sentencing, John's attorney spoke on his behalf and said that John did not want to put Rebecca's family through a trial, which is why he pled guilty to the second degree charge. And that is the case of Rebecca Gay. That is what happened to her. And there are so many conflicting opinions when it comes to this case. As you can imagine, there are so many people who say, how could you possibly put yourself in the position to be involved and allow this man into your life? Knowing his past, how would someone ever be comfortable again, getting engaged to this man, marrying this man, letting this man being around their children? In Sally's case, that would be Rebecca. How are you possibly comfortable letting John around Rebecca? And in Rebecca's case, it's Conway. How are you possibly comfortable letting John around Conway? However, I think it is a testament to both of their characters. I think it shows how good of people they are and how pure people they are in the sense that they wanted to believe the good. They wanted to believe that he changed. They wanted to believe that he was better and that he was turning a new leaf and starting a new chapter in his life. They wanted to believe all of that. And I think that it's incredibly unfortunate and selfish of John to put that family through that. And I also think it's baffling that John was ever let out of prison to begin with, especially in the beginning. Getting two years for attempted murder is absolutely unfathomable. And look at where it led. Now, like I said, John was sentenced to 56 years in prison. However, four months after his prison sentence began, on August 28, 2013, John White was found hanging in his cell at 4 a.m. He was attempted to be revived. However, it was unsuccessful, so he died at 56 years old. And I guess the good thing about that, if you want to look for the good in that, is that John will never be a free man again, and he will never be released again. This whole case is incredibly frustrating, and like I said in the beginning, I can already read the comments now, and I just can't wait to see what you guys have to say about this one, because I know this case gets me fired up from so many different angles. So I can't wait to hear what you guys have to say about it. But with that being said, you guys, that is all for me today. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Killer Instinct. If you're new here, hi, my name is Savannah and I'm the host of Killer Instinct. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. That way you never miss an episode. We post weekly on the podcast every Wednesday. Then again, every Thursday on YouTube as well. You're not going to want to miss it. I'll be back tomorrow for the last day of Halloween. And until then, stay safe. Bye guys.